chairing this session and also giving a talk. And the order of the speakers is going to be changed just slightly. I'm listed as the last speaker. I'm going to be the first speaker, and then the order will be the same otherwise. And um, the reason I'm changing that is that I stuck my presentation in just as a placeholder in case one of the others didn't show up. But they all showed up, fortunately. Um, furthermore, it um, facilitated my intention for my um, semi-paper, which is to give an overview of the uh, session and an overview of the book on which the session is based. Um, this is the third book in a series. Or the presenters are presenting uh, information related to chapters in the book. And the book is, is on alleviating world suffering. Um, and if it will look like this red one here on the screen, it will say alleviating world suffering instead of just world suffering. And um, it will be a kind of companion to this one in that this first book was about world suffering. Uh, my grandfather uh, went to China 100 years ago and took a job for the, with Commercial Press, the biggest press in Asia at the time. And he's listed in the encyclopedia for the press as having brought colored printing to China. Well, I am, uh, I'm told, famous for bringing suffering to Isquals. <laughs> I'm bringing suffering to the quality of life by emphasizing the negative component of uh, well-being uh, and, uh, and quality of life. And, and uh, I argue that it's been neglected and, and it's useful to, to emphasize that as well as the positive. Uh, so the, uh, the new book, which will come out next year, uh, uh, presumably in the spring, um, We'll have about 30 chapters, like the original book on world suffering. And this is how I made it work. Uh, I sent out invitations to about 100 researchers based upon literature review and listening to uh, people at conferences and inviting people that had done research related to alleviating world suffering to um, submit a, an abstract and to write a chapter. Uh, 60 people agreed to work on a chapter. I got 40 chapter proposals. Um, 16 chapters have been finalized, and about 15 are still in, in progress. Um, about uh, 10 to 20 of, of, of the papers either uh, they, the author dropped out or I rejected the papers. Um, the completion date for all of the chapters is November, which is two months away and uh, publication next year. This is uh, an overview of the table of contents, giving the eight parts that I uh, identified, perspectives or uh, basic concepts, uh, quality of life research, part two, part three, um, personal and social caring, and four, switching to the macro level, world development, relief and recovery, and then staying at that macro level, um, a section on health and violence and human rights and finally uh, future suffering, preventing future suffering. Uh, I will show you uh, each of these sections in greater detail. These are tentatively the titles of each chapter in each section and uh, as you can see in the first section I am uh, leading with the chapter toward a paradigm of global suffering alleviation, and then there are several other uh, uh, foundational uh, chapters. And then in the next section on, on quality of life research, uh, Joe Sergi uh, is listed and he's going to be a presenter today, and then uh, an economist and uh, Ken Lam and Vicki Lam do a lot of research on quality of life and, and child will be, will be giving a chip. Be, have a chapter. And the third section will have, um, will emphasize personal and social caring or the individual level and 
Rhonda Phillips will be presenting uh, her, her uh, uh, chapter or, or presenting material from, from her chapter. Following that is a, a section on, on, as I said, macro level uh, global development, disaster recovery, and, and so forth. Uh, the fifth and sixth sections are likewise at this global macro level on health and violence, respectively. Uh, well, one thing I should note, and that one of the chapters there, the last one on the page, is, is, is by Richard Estes, who was here and, and one of the founding fathers of this organization. And he has a ch chapter on uh, sexual exploitation of children. Uh, then the last two um, sections are on human rights, dignity, and justice, and finally, uh, preventing future suffering. And in that section, uh, I, he Won Kwan uh, will be giving uh, her presentation on altruistic values of self and, and in group. And then I'll be talking about, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, I'm not going to have another presentation, uh, but I will have a concluding chapter. And in the concluding chapter, I'm planning to emphasize the future. And, and prevention of suffering in the future. And, and I think, uh, and, and what I also will encourage is, is for quality of life research to, to take the future into account more in, in research that it's doing. Um, and I'm going to focus that future emphasis around environmental concerns uh, and climate change in particular. Uh, the, the um, paradigm that I'm going to uh, outline in the first chapter uh, begins by saying, despite global economic growth, global suffering is rising fast as, as well. And, and, and uh, so it seems like perhaps we can design a gross domestic suffering index. It might be useful to think about that, just like it's been useful to think about gross national happiness indicators. Uh, then I will ask, what are the types of suffering from a global policy standpoint? Uh, and, and in that domain, I have armed conflict, disaster, displacement, extreme poverty, starvation, violence, illness, social humiliation, as in social suffering, hopelessness. And then I'll, I'll look at the severity of each type and then what types of things can be done about it. But now if we switch from this global level to a individual or micro level, um, the typology of suffering that we've been using uh, in, in writing about suffering so far uh, is uh, the, the four types, physical, mental, which includes emotional, interpersonal, which is uh, uh, family and, and close uh, personal relations, and then social suffering, which is societal or institutional stigmas and discrimination based. So racism is a good example of social suffering. But if going back to that previous slide, uh, see the difference in types of suffering, if you move to the global level, uh, gets at policy issues. So, so the book is going to emphasize policy a lot, but it's also emphasizing the individual level of suffering and also what the individual can cannot do to deal with uh, personal suffering. One of the things I'm going to have in this first chapter is, is something like this decision tree, which, which starts with uh, identifying personal values and moving to ask the questions about the types of values, and then finally looking at how those values relate to uh, individual types of suffering. At the bottom, there are, are things that can be done to uh, alleviate suffering. Uh, this is something I just thought I'd show. It's an it's a ecosystem, social ecosystem model that, we'll, that I'll have in the last chapter because it emphasizes future so much. Um, finally, the, some miscellaneous observations regarding alleviation of world suffering. First, the top priority for alleviation of world suffering includes eradicating structural obstacles like inequality, deep poverty, and overpopulation. Secondly, social suffering, for example, humiliated refugees, 
without relief leads to violent conflict. The same is true with racism and, and serious, other serious types of social suffering. And finally, unalleviated suffering stems largely from uh, self-interest, drive for power, lack of empathy, loss of civil society, and beliefs that suffering builds character. So I'm including both individual, as you can see, and macro level considerations. Uh, and uh, that's it. I'll entertain one or two brief questions before we move on. But and feel free not to ask any questions. Um, the, the first presenter will be, uh, I believe, Rhonda Phillips. You're listed in the, uh, the first in the program, right? Uh, she and her colleague from Turkey and Purdue uh, uh, have been working on caring economics, and she will find her, her PowerPoint and uh, talk on that. Uh, she, incidentally, is, uh, as you almost certainly know, the, not the president, but the or are you president? The president. Uh, this Qualls, and she's been a very effective leader for the past three years, and she's also written uh, or edited 18 books, and she's dean of the Honors College at Purdue. So we're lucky to have uh, her as our distinguished first speaker. I want to say thanks to Ron because his work in suffering and pushing that forward is really uh, revolutionary in many ways. And there are many people that prefer not to talk about it and they prefer to. This one is not the corrected version. This is um, the one I had worked and worked and worked on and then found out that it's not on my flash drive. So you're getting the, uh, the 1.0 version instead of the polished finished version, but so, so be it. But anyway, I just want to say thank you to Ron because he has done so much in pushing forward on us thinking about suffering and really changing our perspectives on how we look at quality of life and well-being across a lot of dimensions. Uh, my background is in um, community development, urban regional planning, economics, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about how can we make our economic systems better, our, and that of course has implications for our social and, and beyond um, domains. And so um, I have a colleague, um, Ahmet, uh, who wanted to be here but could not, and he is, I've known him for years, he's now a visiting uh, professor at Purdue, and he and his, um, his spouse, who is also a visiting professor, went back to Turkey uh, to visit family after a year at Purdue, arrived in the middle of the coup. And it was just really stressful and really drove home um, why we need to have systems that care more about people and those elements rather than just uh, things that sometimes can't even be explained. And so it, it was really tough. Uh, he, they did get out, they came back. He was allowed out, but not his family. And then finally they were allowed back in. So we're relieved to have them back at Purdue for another year. <laughs> And uh, anyway, it really, really, uh, I guess, the flavored the perspectives of some of the stuff you'll see in our presentation. And I'm presenting on his behalf since he couldn't join us today. Let's see. I guess I'll just do it this way. Anyway, um, I knew that was going to happen. I'm so sorry I'm out of pocket. <laughs> Let's see if we can do it this way. I tend to move a lot when I talk, so I'll try to be very still and talk to you. Um, we wanted to look at ideas around this uh, caring economics. In other words, can you build in aspects into economic systems that look at the human dimensions more so than the traditional market-based systems do? And so we wanted to um, look at a couple things. One is the values around caring, and then we wanted to look at um, what that means for market-based economy. Now, Mehmet is, is very into this idea that market-based uh, economic models are 
you know, if we look at the negative aspects of it, it really is all about the self-interest guided by um, utilitarian interest and also um, a lot of destruction and greed and, and can lead to suffering. Uh, I tend to have a, a little bit more moderate perspective in that I think there still can be some changes to market-based economic systems that we can make it more compassionate and empathetic and move forward um, without tossing out the whole system. But anyway, you'll, you'll get the flavor of that as we go through. Um, there are all sorts of suffering that are caused uh, by market-based economics, and again, we quote some of Ryan's work there, um, including physical, mental, uh, social suffering, and they can be all sorts of things, from the very individual in terms of uh, losing work or not having work that is fulfilling, and gender inequality that is rampant throughout the world in many countries, including the U.S., where women still only uh, make about three quarters of what men make for the same jobs, which is still hard to believe, but it happens. And um, so it, it runs both from the individual to the effects on society, both at the family level and community level, when things aren't right in the economic system, and it's directly impactful. So what's this idea of caring economics? Um, several years ago, a, a researcher, um, I, I mean Eisler, it, coined this term uh, caring economics, meaning that we would have values about caring for ourselves and others and nature, because that's the framework in which we all work and, and live. And so if, until we are able to integrate elements of those, of, of not just caring for ourselves and our and economic values, but um, again, the environment and our communities, we can't truly get to the point where we will be um, at an area where we can alleviate suffering. So anyway, there, there's groups out there and there's individual researchers and others who think that this idea of caring economics could be an option. And some of the values, as, as we've mentioned, are things like altruism, empathy, compassion, and partnership. And I'm going to talk about a couple of those. Um, I particularly like the idea of partnership because that's where we can see very applied, on the ground, uh, direct results in, in many contexts. I mean, it's, it's harder to say, okay, we're going to be a more empathetic society, but then how do you actually actualize that in some ways? And that becomes very difficult. Whereas things such as partnership can be actualized and, and motive, uh, implemented pretty quickly uh, versus things that are societal changes over time, such as uh, having more compassion and empathy. So there's a couple different sets of, of studies that I just want to quickly review, and, and Ryan, you'll let me know if I, I run over time. It, it, we looked at things in neuroscience and economic behavior and psychology, and we wanted to really see if, if, if we are truly only the economic actor who only is in the self-interest, or do we have more to us than that as humans? And, and indeed we do. There, there are results that show, particularly uh, Singer is a researcher in that area, and Davidson, that there are elements of empathy and compassion and altruistic behavior related to um, economic motivation. And these studies you know, do everything from hooking people up to the electrodes to monitor what's happening to doing something called functional MRI, which watches the parts of the brain that light up or respond to different stimuli. And those stimuli were about sharing um, economic wealth. I mean, they would give choices about money and compassion about um, economic choices. And indeed, as humans, we have that capability. <laughs> and, and most of us know that. Maybe some of it's been um, buried for a long time, but it's there. And, and so some of the, if you look at the physiological components, that they, they are there and they prove that we have the capacity for it. Now, of course, drawing that out at the scale that we would need uh, to make radical changes across country level is, is another challenge. So another set of findings that we, we looked at um, is that there, there is empathy towards people who are not direct relatives because a lot of studies will have uh, someone's spouse or uh, their relative as part of the test and then, um, then they would put strangers in with people to see if those levels would drop or what would happen. And indeed, there were some changes, but it did show that there was still that ability to be compassionate um, across communities uh, from both small and, and large communities. And it also showed that there were some altruistic behaviors between groups of people, even if those groups were not related or they were completely different from one's own group. 
that they could still show those behaviors. And again, most of the, all these studies are conducted usually with something connected to economics, so money choices, sharing money that they're given, that kind of thing. And, um, and also, you know, and, and we found that, or some of the studies have found that lower income groups, um, and, and I wouldn't say unexpectedly, that was one of the edits I took out, show more altruistic behaviors than wealthy groups. And, and that's probably not unexpected at all. And that, that, again, is one of the things we went back and, and changed. Um, so we're, it's there. I mean, it, it's, it's there. We just have to figure out how to take it to scale to make this work more across um, societies. And then the third set of findings, we really looked at how can we adopt these actions. And it, it dealt with training. And in fact, there's been several studies that there's been a two-week period or shorter periods of training for people to learn altruistic behavior. In other words, you know, you can actually change and may help people change. And so they found that they were able to transfer those activities that they learned in their training to the economic um, decision making. And, and that's pretty significant right there that we know we can change. It's not just the economic assumption that we all act in self-interest and that's just the way it is and it'll never change. Actually, we do have the capacity to change. And, and that's sort of exciting to see that. So I wanted to talk to you about partnership because to, to me, again, this is the part where we can make a difference and see that connection without waiting for long-term, uh, long time frame social changes. And can, uh, partnerships are other words for things like connection, association, alliance, affiliation, cooperation. We have a lot of names that we, we call it. And um, also, you know, in, even in the workplace, trying to alleviate some of the suffering and improve well-being um, in the corporate world and, and workplace world, regardless of which sector you're working in, can really help the lives of many people. And, and there's many ways that that's been um, done. Um, let me see, check this. Yeah. Uh, I, one of the slides I added to, to mine is the idea of cooperation, uh, cooperatives, and I wanted to talk just briefly about that, is that the cooperative model in economic systems strives to bring more people into decision making. And by doing that, that tends to enhance fulfillment. And it also in, tends to enhance well-being of the workers who are part of that cooperative. And it's, it, it shows that it doesn't only the benefits convey to those who are directly involved as workers in a cooperative, but to those they serve. That that, that same mentality is, is sort of, uh, you know, uh, translated forward in terms of the clients, in terms of the customers and others. And so cooperatives are one way that we can track that kind of caring behavior and economic uh, activity is through cooperative uh, development. And that, that holds a lot of potential. And it's interesting to know that despite all the changes we've had in our economic system in the last several decades, where it, it seems like self-interest is, is the primary motivator in many situations, if not direct incivility, <laughs> um, is that cooperatives have enjoyed a resurgence of interest. So, <coughs> so we had cooperatives a long time ago, and they, they actually have history way back in the guilds of, you know, and middle uh, ages merchant guilds. But anyway, they sort of fell out of favor as we push forward this idea that everything's about the bottom line and we've got to push profits and on and on and on. And then now they're coming back. And so we're seeing a rise of um, the cooperative model, not only in um, developed countries, but developing countries the world over. And there's been uh, literally a resurgence of interest in people wanting to know more, how do they do this, how do they, how do, they do more community-based economic enterprise so that they can be part of that. And um, it's really encouraging to see this. A couple years ago, we had the UN um, year of the co-op. And, and that was very exciting to see what was happening all over the world in this area. In addition to other types of partnerships, there's community-based businesses, which can include cooperative models, as well as very socially minded and oriented private businesses. And, and that model is also uh, really emerging in some areas as um, alternatives. These are corporations that you know, for corp are, are really integrating principles of corporate social responsibility into their business practices. So in other words, they may um, try to source more locally for their inputs. They may 
um, agree to, to pay certain wages that meet a living standard, and, and on and on. And so that's exciting to see too. It's, it's not at the, I guess, level or scale that we need to be to say that we uh, successfully now have a caring economy, but it is encouraging to see some changes. And then finally, you know, it, it, I don't, there, there's probably no way to replace the existing market-based economic systems entirely. I mean, that would take a revolution of a scale that, that I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but, but who knows what will happen in the next couple of years. But what we can do is integrate more caring attributes. So if we can have options within our systems to be more equitable and just, then we can start alleviating suffering because as we know, Suffering is directly related to economic systems um, in many, many ways, and it does impact the social systems as well as our environments, natural environments. So, you know, I always like to try to have a positive note in anything I do, and so I, we ended our chapter and the presentation with this idea is that we're the ones who created the system, this modern economic system for the last, really, 250, 300 years. Surely, we can improve it, and surely we can make those adjustments that can help alleviate suffering at scale that's needed. I mean, we're the ones who did it, surely we can make it better. So with that, I conclude, and um, if I guess we'll wait for questions at the very end, or, or now? Okay, okay, thank you. Time for one or two questions. without a pocket, but anyway, um, there's a couple of ways. One is that as people learn more that the cooperative system is available and is an option, that's, that's one way to encourage it. Um, another trend that we're seeing, particularly in the U.S., it, it's not a massive trend, but it affects a small number of businesses, is that when, for example, um, a privately held company, uh, maybe an owner established on company, they want to continue that legacy at, and they're, maybe are not interested in selling outright to uh, some other entity, are transitioning to employee-owned enterprises. So this model is becoming more popular. In other words, if a founder has a company and then they want to retire, instead of just simply selling it and not sure what will happen to all those employees, they actually let the employees become the owners. And, and that's, again, a very encouraging trend. And then going back to cooperatives, you know, we have the, the famous um, the region in Spain that, that has the world's largest cooperative, um, and that's helped other countries see that they can do that too. And, and actually there's been an increase in the number of cooperatives worldwide over the last several years, and I think that, again, is showing that people want alternatives. They don't want to have to stay within the same system where maybe there's not a lot of control or input into what's happening in their economy and their own system. Um, at the same time, we realize that the modern market-based economy is why many standards of living have improved dramatically throughout the world. But at the same time, there's got probably it's, it's time for some calibration, for some uh, new insights into how to make this work for more and not just for you know the top um, earners, but that there works more. So cooperatives are, are great. There's a actually a, a big push by um, the UN has a, a whole site that you can go and pull materials down about cooperatives. There's an international association that, that promotes the idea of cooperative enterprise. And um, and also to support any co-ops that you have in your area, you know, to be supportive of that, whatever uh, whatever kind of co-ops they are. Uh, you know, find out who they are and learn from them. Uh, but it's a very exciting model, and, and I really I like seeing that, that we're becoming more interested in it. Thank you. The next uh, speaker is uh, Hae-Wan Kwan. She's a native Korean, um, but she's a, uh, a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Iowa in the United States. And uh, her author, I believe, is from Turkey. Co-authors from Turkey. I heard her at 
sociology convention giving a talk about this research, and so I recruited them to uh, develop a chapter. And um, her interests uh, are primarily in this area, uh, of more broadly social psychology, and uh, uh, we're very glad to have her here to present. inviting me to present my work um, at this conference in Seoul, which is my hometown, and I have very good excuse for visiting my family and friends here. So thanks for that. Um, and I'm so glad to get to know about this international, wonderful international conference and this research group. It's my first time here um, to attend this conference. And I'm honored, uh, so honored to present my work at this conference. This work, this presentation, is based on the work that I, my co-author, bring in. And I have been working um, for um, the chapter of the book that Ron is editing. Uh, and I promised yesterday to Ron that I will send our final, final draft. <laughs> we have several drafts. So we, I will send a final, final draft by um, mid-September, well, around mid-September. So any kinds of insightful feedback on this work would be very appreciated. OK. Um, so as many of you already know, altruism is often linked to selflessness. Um, it's about selfless behavior uh, that accepts, that sacrifice personal, personal cost for the good of others. Um, Altruistic behaviors are those that transcend, uh, transcend self-interest. Yet, when it comes to the story of um, the self and identity, those who are altruistic, who are engaging in these uh, altruistic behaviors uh, and conducting selfless behavior are far from lacking a consistent representation of the self and identity. Rather, they are the people who, are, who have very strong altruistic self and altruistic identity that motivate them to engage in altruistic behaviors. Um, indeed, un identity researchers have found that a personal identity disposition is one of the, uh, the personal identity disposition that values altruistic behaviors and orientations is one of the primary prerequisites of altruism. Uh, they found that this um, personal identity is a strong predictor of pro-social and altruistic behaviors and orientations. Um, despite their contribution to finding out this uh, the role of personal identity in shaping altruistic behaviors, these uh, previous research have omitted the role of social identities and social interaction, the, the importance of social interaction in shaping personal identities that motivate people to uh, do those um, altruistic behaviors. One of the limitations in um, this previous research is that, so according to this um, identity theory, which is one of the key theories in identity build uh, identifies that there are two processes in um, shaping help, sorry, self and identity. Self first uh, strives to be stable and reduce uncertainty through self-verification process. But on the other hand, self and identity develop through um, social interactions and self-reflective perceptions of others. So this social identity part and the identity development through social interactions with other um, 
have very important impact on the development of personal identity. However, very little work explores um, altruistic personal identities as they relate to social identities. Um, and almost no work expands this to integrating and exploring the implication of this process that potentially helps alleviation of world suffering. So our study suggests investigating the linkage between altruistic personal identities and altruistic social identities. Um, here, in-groups are a very important source, very critical source of development of person, uh, social identity and provide cognitive schema. Things like how to think, how to evaluate, how to, how to value things, and how to behave. Um, and so people tend to build their attitudes, their values, and their behavior in accordance with an in-group that, uh, in that they identify with. So here's our, the, this slide visualizes our theory and operationalization in this chapter. Um, okay, I'm finding my script. In this study, we argue that the relationship between the two, uh, altruistic social identity and altruistic personal identity especially, um, are best captured by examining value commitment, value attributions of the self and the, the in-group. Why social values? Values are core to the self and identity, and I, personal identities are especially constructed through personal value commitment. Which value do you have, which value we emphasize and prioritize, helps you understand who you are as a person. Values also push uh, behavior towards desired outcomes. Values give motivations to behave in a certain way. So we hypothesize that altruistic social identity influences altruistic personal identity. If one, um, one is identifying with people who values altruistic um, orientations, the person will be more likely to also adapt those values as guiding principles of their lives, of their own lives, that potentially leading to altruist, um, altruist behavior that alleviates others' suffering. This paper uses nationally represented data collected by a new cross-cultural survey. Morris, we have a very long title for this, but in short, Morris Gemmes. Um, so we collected nationally presented data from four countries, the United States, France, Turkey, and Korea, I omitted Korea. Um, and to measure altruistic personal identities, we used the um, four items from portrait values questionnaire from Schwartz theory. So we use benevolence and universalism items because they are under cross-social domains that transcend, um, transcend self-interest and that taps into altruistic um, orientations. And um, to measure our important um, independent variable, altruistic social identity, we incorporate a, a new measurement strategy. First, we asked people, the, our respondents, to choose three most important, about, important groups they think, they think of themselves, when they think of themselves. And then we showed this diagram-like question um, and asked them choose up to three most important values they think, when they think of those, their, um, their in-groups. And among these, so these 10 value labels are from Schwartz value theory that identified 10 values, 10 basic values of human across cultures. 
and we, as I said, we are using this um, universalism and benevolence items that falls that is fall under this um, self transcendence domain. Okay, um, here are our descriptive statistics. So we applied quota sampling on age groups, gender, and income to get nationally represented data as possible. However, note that our Turkey sample is pretty younger and highly educated here. Um, and this might be due to the higher access of those younger and highly educated people to the, um, the access to the internet is very high among those younger and highly educated people in Turkey. So for that, um, here are our first um, results on benevolence value especially. So we conducted an OLS regression on personal benevolence, benevolence identity to examine the relationship between benevolent social identity and benevolent personal identity that values caring for close others, including family members and close friends. Hope you guys can see this. Um, so, in the United States, France, and, Tur and Korea, those who identify with um, benevolent in-groups here and are more likely to value the welfare of close friends, close others, in their own lives, suggesting a linkage between benevolent social identity and benevolent personal identity um, in these three countries. However, note that there is no effect in Turkey. In Turkey, instead, which group a person identifies with matters for the personal inclination to value benevolence. The next section, we conducted another OLS regression on universalism to examine the relationship between caring social identity and caring personal identity um, that values social diversity and equality. Um, again, in the United States, France, and Turkey, those who identify with caring in groups are more likely to value the social equality and diversity in their own lives suggesting um, the linkage between a caring social identity and a caring personal identity. But note that in Korea, there is no significant effect on this. So in Korea, neither in-group universalism value nor in-group types show statistically significant effects on personal inclination to value equality and social, uh, social diversity. To summarize, our empirical research show that identifying with English that prioritize altruistic values is positively associated with holding altruistic personal um, identity. We also found, however, um, very interesting cross-cultural differences. This, um, this hypothesis that we hold um, was partially supported in Turkey and South Korea. In Turkey, benevolent personal identity was not associated with benevolent per, um, social identity. So our best guess here is to understand this um, in relation with the high religious and traditionalist context in Turkey. In Turkey, mere belonging and conformity to social groups become more important for personal development than reflecting on group, group characteristics. And also in Korea, we couldn't find um, the linkage between universalistic social identity and universalistic personal identity. Um, so at this point, my, guess, my best guess is to understand this in terms of collectivistic, collectivistic context of Korea, uh, where English culture has much more powerful influence on the development of benevolent um, personal identity that is very closely linked to the in-group coherence. But in terms of universalistic identity, that is not exclusively associated with in-group coherence or culture, 
um, that may have less, relatively less influence on the development of personal identity on this um, domain. Okay. Um, so, and of course we have several limitations in our study because we used a cross-sectional data. We could not identify the closure linkage, closure direction of the relationship. It could go the other way around. For instance, um, people who hold, who values altruistic uh, orientation more tend to, might choose, uh, choose in groups that values altruistic orientations. So uh, that's that. And the linkage between altruistic identity and altruistic behaviors that lead to alleviating the suffering of others is partly assumed be, uh, based on previous research pretty um, large out there, uh, but it is not empirically tested in, a, in our data. So future research with better data should, I would say, should um, investigate these two limitations that our study just leaves behind. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. And if you have any questions, let me know. Um, it's a big question, <laughs> really. Um, maybe the best way to do is cultivate um, altruistic culture in the society as a whole, so that in groups can, um, so that that may help help individuals. Um, to be more easily exposed to those values in their daily lives. It's, it sounds like a philosophical solution to uh, your question, but... Well, ultimately, you want to create a social identity. Mm -mm. You want to get people to uh, belong to uh, groups, become affiliated with groups that would propagate those values. values. Right? Mm -hmm. I didn't find it. Right? Mm -mm. Okay, thank you. In the educational system, they could use that to kids select groups that talk to my Mm-hmm. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you so much. And our next and last speaker. Surgery. 
most of you know, who are, if you're old timers in this organization, he is one of the founding uh, pioneers of, of uh, quality of life research. Uh, he, he is, uh, um, in his day job, he is a professor, <laughs> a real estate professor of marketing at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia where he is also Executive Director of the Management Institute of Quality of Life Studies. Um, he was the founding editor of this called Applied Research in Quality of Life, and he's edited um, uh, six books, no, 13 books, written six books, and nine textbooks, which added up is over 15 anyway, well, over 20 actually. Somehow he's still alive. <laughs> um, we're very glad to, to uh, have him here to present his ideas that he's going to write up. Uh, we're especially glad because his two authors, uh, one of them f fell ill and the other one was not able to participate. So, Thank you, Ron. Okay, if you if you note that there is actually a change in the title of the presentation, and and the reason uh, being uh, because uh, my co-authors uh, sort of dropped out. <laughs> So I, I, I changed the, the title and the gist of that presentation. And, and the impetus is, as it was mentioned, is uh, Ron Anderson bringing in a sort of uh, pushing us to make a distinction between um, human suffering and what we customarily look at in terms of the concept of well-being and the metrics of well-being. So if, let's say if you look at some of the established metrics of well-being, just pick any, any well-established metrics, uh, let's say the Human Development Index or uh, from the United Nations, or possibly Richard Estes um, Social Progress Index or the OECD um, Index, the Better Life Index, uh, all of these are, are very well-established index indices. Um, you know, we take into account uh, indicators of well-being and ill-being, but we all talk about it as indicators of well-being. And Ron Anderson is forcing us to make a distinction. Yes, there is a difference between indicators of ill-being versus well-being. And I think it would be fruitful to make that distinction very clearly because the policy implications are quite significant. So my attempt here is to actually try to make that distinction. And I'll take you through a conceptual framework that will allow us to do that. And this conceptual framework looks at, again, distinctions between um, indicators of well-being versus ill-being. And we want to essentially make distinction between outcome indicators and action indicators and from that perspective also try and distinguish indicators of ill-being from well-being at the individual level, at the community level, at the societal level because the policy implications making those distinctions again are pretty significant. So let's try and do this and take you through a, um, a tour of how a, 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 about um, trying to make those distinctions very clearly. The theoretical model that would allow us to make those distinctions uh, in, in, a, in a very clear way is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now most of you, I would, I would assume that familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and, and again, this is a depiction of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and, and the essence of, of the distinction there is that 
you know, we have a, um, um, a, a pyramid of needs or a hierarchy of needs, and those can be distinguished in, in, in terms of basic needs, uh, psychological needs, self-fulfillment needs. But in, 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 you know, to further simplify this, we can talk about basic needs and the satisfaction of basic needs are very much associated with ill-being, right? So what you want to do is you want to reduce ill-being by meeting basic needs, doing a better job meeting basic needs such as safety, security, safety, physiological needs, and, and the like. And then if we're talking about well-being, then again, what we need to do is we, uh, you know, much of what we do is to try and, 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 and capture those indicators of well-being so that we can enhance well-being, right? A again, a very, a very important distinction, and rightly so, and rightly so. So, uh, again, um, using Maslow's hierarchy of needs in order to make the distinction between ill-being and well-being, and you'll see how that translates in terms of the actual indicators. So let's look at those indicators and make the distinction between ill-being and well-being at the individual level, individual level. Again, we're going to be making a distinction between individual level of analysis versus community level of analysis as well as societal level of analysis, right? Because the policy implications tend to be varied as such. So at the individual level analysis, again, we're making distinction between outcome indicators versus uh, action indicators. Now, what are those? Outcome indicators are essentially the end result. And you'll, you'll see that when I'll give you the examples. Action indicators are the kinds of indicators that are very much associated with some very specific policies and programs that lead to certain states that desired states, i.e. outcomes. So action indicators feed into outcome indicators. And again, from a policy perspective, that's, it's extremely important to make those distinctions because if we're focusing on ill-being and human suffering that we want to know exactly what those actions that would lead to the reduction, right, the reduction of ill-being of a specific population. So, in the context of out, outcome indicators, so let's just zoom in on this, outcome indicators. And in that context, we further make the distinction between indicators that are associated with the elements or the parts versus whole. And let me give you an example of what we're talking about here. So, on the right, the right hand side of the table, we got indicators of human well-being. The left-hand side of the table would be indicators of human ill-being. Again, that's what we em the emphasis of human suffering. Again, we make the, the distinction between what you call the parts versus the whole. So relying on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and if we're looking at basic needs, you see how that translates in terms of those indicators. Indicators of disease incidence, pain, and health risk. Indicators of psychopathology and emotional suffering. Indicators of disability and daily functioning. Indicators of victimization, house deficiency and adequate shelter. Income sufficiency and basic material possessions. Financial debt and, and liability. Minimum saving and retirement shelter. Insurance protection, that kind of thing. These are very much related to basic needs, right? And therefore, we talk about them in terms of ill-being. And of course, uh, uh, these are the things that we're trying to reduce. I mean, we're trying to reduce the, uh, disease incidence and pain and, and health risk and psychopathology and on and on, right? So you know, in that context, we make the distinction between parts versus whole. So in terms of indicators, some of those Indicators are related to specific dimensions of basic needs, as broken down as you know, as such. But then we we can also focus on the whole, on the whole indicators of what we call the tolerable life. Tolerable. Life. There is there is quite a, a distinction between indicators of a tolerable life versus indicators of 
personal happiness. Oh. Sorry. Again, we're looking at indicators of tolerable life versus indicators of personal happiness. You know, so much in terms of the subjective well-being area have focused on personal happiness, but wait a minute. This personal happiness, just the low end of personal happiness, is a reflection of tolerable life, human suffering, how people feel about so. No, I, I think these are two separate dimensions, independent dimension, and they have to be distinguished, again, from each other. If you're looking at, again, the parts uh, indicators of parts of human well-being at the individual level, again, um, and this is the right hand, so, right hand side of the table, indicators of sociability and friendships, belongingness and group affiliation, leisure engagement, engagement in sports and recreational activities, occupational status and prestige, economic success, educational attainment, engagement of professional development, engagement in cultural activities, and the arts, engagement in intellectual activities, engagement in spiritual and, and charitable activities. These are the kinds of things that make life worth living. That's quite a difference between, you know, an end state that reflects a life worth living versus human suffering, don't you think? Absolutely. And thank you, Ron, for, for pushing us in that direction. So, these are outcome states, outcome indicators. And again, we made the distinction between parts versus whole. Let's look at action indicators. Sometimes in, in quality of life um, research studies, we talk about those as input indicators. If you use a systems model, we talk about input indicators, probably throughput indicators. Uh, output indicators, and sometimes, you know, if you use the systems model, output indicators are essentially outcome indicators, and action indicators are, are reflective, re reflective of uh, what, uh, what a, a lot of system, uh, systems researchers would talk about in terms of input and throughput. Okay. These are the things that would lead to the output, right? So action indicators, in, that, in the context of action indicators, we make the distinction between Things that people do in order to help themselves achieve those desired states. So you see that yellow box at the very left-hand side, indicators of individual efforts versus indicators of institutional efforts. Uh, that institutions help people, individuals, achieve certain desired states, right? So we want to make a distinction between action indicators based on what people do for themselves versus what institutions do for people, right? Let's see how that is operationalized. So when we're, let's look at um, the left-hand side, indicators of human well-being. And again, we're looking at action indicators now. Indicators of individual efforts re reduce disease incidence, pain, and, and health risks. Well, again, the outcome indicators reduce disease, in I mean, essentially the reduction of disease incidence, pain, and health risk. But people do things, and we need to capture what, what are those programs, what are those policies that work, that, well, no, no, that, let me rephrase that. What are those individual efforts that people, you know, use for themselves to try and, and, and get them to uh, not fall ill, not become sick, right? To reduce their own health risk. You know, eating healthy, for example, that's an individual effort. Refraining from smoking tobacco, right? That would be an individual effort. And therefore, Again, we need to have indicators, action indicators that reflect what people do to help themselves, you know, reduce disease incidence, pain, and, and health risk. The same thing could be said in terms of psychopathology, disability, victimization, 
housing deficiency. Again, what do people do for themselves, individual efforts? These have to be documented because, again, if we know exactly what people do to help themselves reduce human suffering, personal human suffering, right? Then we would be able to systematize this process and generate the kinds of programs that would help individuals adopt those, uh, those behaviors that would lead to the reduction of human suffering as such. And, and, and you see that individual efforts related to the enhancement of well-being are drastically different, are likely to be very different from those indicators from action indicators that are related to, uh, again, the reduction of human well, ill-being. Um, by the way, uh, if you're interested in this, I can send you the slides so that you, you, know, you don't have to strain your eyes. <laughs> so the distinction then in terms of individual efforts versus institutional efforts, the institutional efforts is that Again, we have institutions that are designed to help people reduce suffering and enhance their own well-being. So we need to have some very specific institutional indicators, Inst you know, indicators of institutional efforts. And as you see from the left-hand side, institutional efforts, indicators of institutional efforts reduce disease incidence, pain, and, and health risk. You know, what are those? What, what, what do hospitals do? What clinics do? Right? Well, uh, what are those all the healthcare system and, 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 the various, um, and the various organizational entities within do in order to help with that particular endeavor? So that would be an example of institutional efforts. And the same thing can be said on the right-hand side of the table, again, looking at action indicators of human well-being. So if you're getting the gist of it, we can do the same kind of analysis, break things down at the community level now. So we're not dealing at the individual level now, we, we're looking at indicators of ill-being versus uh, well-being at the community level. And in, in that context, we have you know, outcome indicators, and we have indicators of parts versus indicators of whole. And in terms of action indicators, now we're not dealing with individual efforts because we're dealing with, again, a, an emergent whole, which is at the community. And in that context, we have specific institutions, right, that, uh, are, that engage in certain efforts designed to reduce human suffering. Right? So those are government institutions, those are business institutions, those are efforts by NGOs. And again, example, if we look at the example, if we look at the outcomes, the outcomes again, um, uh, at the community level, the, the, the nature of those indicators change. And uh, on the human well-being side, we, we, at the community, you can capture work productivity and income, consumption of non-basic goods and services, the quality of leisure and recreational activities. Now, this is at the community level. Not, this is not what's happening at the individual. For a given individual, that's a given community, i.e., let's say, in a place like Seoul, Korea, right? educational attainment, and, 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 the, and, and again, these are indicators of parts which are different from indicators that capture the well-being of the community at large, which would be something like community cohesion and growth, right? Community cohesion and growth. That is an indicator that captures the well-being of the whole community, which is different from the well-being of the individual, which is to be contrasted with Again, if you're looking at ill being, indicators of community survival and resilience, right? And we have a wonderful set of measures that, again, that would capture those types of constructs. But when it comes to also parts, we've got indicators of environmental pollution, of disease incidents, crime and safety, housing conditions, unemployment, poverty, homelessness, cost of living 
community infrastructure, illiteracy and lack of job skills, population density and crowdedness. Again, at the community level. And I'm running out of time, so um, I think you're getting the gist of this now since I've made those distinctions. So, you know, if you're looking at action indicators, what the government is doing, those would be examples of what the government in, is doing and, and, and governments, right? And, and therefore, we need to flesh out those indicators by what the governments um, do in order to alleviate human suffering, uh, i.e. reduction of human ill-being. Government efforts reduce environmental pollution. Government's efforts reduce health-related ill-being and so forth, which would be very different from something like you know, indicators of government efforts to enhance the quality of community landscape. Ah, that's a beautification program. We're not dealing with human suffering. It's a very different animal. And, and then we, we have business. We got business efforts and, you know, all kinds of businesses engage in corporate social responsibility. And, and they do all kinds of wonderful things for the community. Uh, in terms of alleviating poverty and addressing homelessness versus, you know, um, uh, sponsoring arts and culture programs. Again, these have to be captured and, and, and distinguished from others. And, and again, these would be examples of how this is fleshed out. And finally, we can, uh, we can talk about the same kind of thing at the societal level, at the country level. And in that context, again, we have outcome indicators, we have action indicators of well-being versus ill-being, we've got indicators of parts versus whole, we've got action indicators at the, for different kinds of institutions, in, you know, at, and when we're talking about institutional efforts, we're, here we're talking about government or business uh, institutions do, NGOs, as well as international agencies international institutions and and therefore we need to make those distinctions loud and clear and capture all these indicators because once we make those distinctions then the public policy implications of those distinctions become quite evident thank you사진 찍는 분들이죠. 네, 촬영. 촬영하시. 되고 있죠 아직. 네, 찍고 있습니다. 네. 